that in our gardens too. Um, home gardens, urban, suburban, world growers, and farmers. It's all kind of building that network together. Seed library projects can help connect the dots in this local food way and create a human connection through seed sharing and saving. It's that human piece that I want you guys to remember through this talk because it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of talking to people, connecting with people, and networking to make this work. Some considerations, where are we gonna get the seeds from? Are they gonna be donated seeds? Um, a lot of the nurseries and garden centers will donate seed at the end of the year. Saved seed from our gardens, that's a big big source, or purchased seed. How are we gonna pay for it, you know? Where are you gonna store seeds proper, properly to protect from climate and pests? Here we can't just leave our seeds out, it's too hot, too humid. Um, we have every bug under the sun in New Orleans. They will get in there, <laughs> they will ruin your seeds. Um, packaging, how are we going to get these things out to the community? Labor, who's going to do it? <laughs> you know, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, distribution, how are seeds going to be picked up by community members? Is it a fixed location? Is it accessible via public transport? Is it open 24-7 or only during certain hours? Can we mail seeds? And the answer is yes, all of the above. <laughs> Sourcing the seeds, um, Early in the pandemic, I had a stash of seeds that I was using for my school and community projects. All that got canceled, the school shut down, so I was able to get that out to the community. But you run out of things really quickly once word gets out. But what I found is that a lot of seed companies have a donation program because they can't keep old inventory from year to year. They want to get that out when the new seed crop comes in. That's what people are ordering out of seed catalogs. But if they've got stuff left over from the previous season, they often have a mechanism in place to donate that to the community. Um, some of them require a letter on letterhead um, or a tax exemption number. Some only take requests at certain times of the year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. What's interesting about donations is there's no guarantee on what you're gonna get. I've had boxes show up to the house this big, <laughs> And it's full of all kinds of stuff, and I've got little tiny envelopes with just a few things. You never know what they're gonna send you, and it's kind of at their discretion. Um, there's really not a good way to request certain things, and not everything that you get donated is gonna work in your area. So it is kind of like throwing a bowl of spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> so you might get anything. Um, some of them do require you to cover the cost of shipping. Um, it's typically $20 or less, especially for the bigger bulk mailing boxes. And what I found too is that a lot of the local big box stores, so I'm thinking Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, they all have a seed display, right? In the springtime usually. Well, spring's not actually our big gardening season here, it's fall. But when we get to June, July, they're clearing out those seed displays and they're putting in the Halloween decorations, believe it or not. And you can usually catch the manager and have them give you whatever's left over. So make that relationship, maybe come in with a letter with your contact info, some pictures of your garden project or your seed library project and say, hey, you got stuff left over at the end of the season? I'm willing to come get it. And that's worked really well. Um, saved seed, this is seed saved from the community gardens for your own garden, um, homeowners. Seeds um, can be saved, we know that. I'm sure you all know that. Um, Cross-pollination is likely. That can be good or bad. We got a lot of franken zucchinis this year. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> especially the curvets, they crossbreed, right? And you get all kinds of wacky stuff, um, which is kind of fun, but also not always edible, <laughs> right? Um, so cross pollination can be good or bad. Um, sometimes we end up with local land races of things developing, and I'm starting to see that actually. Um, Post Katrina, Ed Hume Seed Company donated a lot of seed pallets, like pallets of seed, to community and school gardens here. People have been saving those seeds now for 16 years on some of those varieties, and they have now morphed into different things. So that's kind of cool. Um, a friend of mine, Margie, is tracking some of that uh, through Sprout Nola, a local nonprofit. But if we keep saving our seed, eventually we end up with kind of highly localized home parts, which is cool. Um, seeds have to be collected, cleaned, and stored properly to be viable if you're saving seed. Um, lots of good resources on how to do that out there. Storage. Y'all love storage. You might start with a little tiny box like that, but guess what? I'm up to three fridges at the house. Yeah, keeping them in the fridge 
because it's so hot and humid here and we don't have AC. So we have to keep them safe. You keep your germination rates as high as possible for as long as possible. Remember, the seed companies, sometimes they're sending you seeds from two or three seasons ago. You look at the number on the seed packet, it might say 2019. I just got some. Remember, some of those seeds will germinate. You want to keep them viable as long as you can. Low humidity, low temperature, no huge swings in temperature when you're storing seeds because that can um, really decrease your germination rate. Organizing and labeling. This is something I really need to work on. This is an extremely well-organized seed library. This is not my fridge. <laughs> but you see how they've got um, you know, sages and thymes, parsley. They've got it all sorted. That saves you time when you need to refill packets if you know where it is. Uh, the fridge is great if you have it, especially for those of you in the south. Um, the thing I've found is if it's propped open or left open, and you've got the freezer compartment up top, and it defrosts into your seeds, that's very bad. So you do want to keep your seeds in something waterproof, if you can. It can be Ziploc bags, it can be plastic coats, but just a word of caution that will happen someday. Um, even just getting uh, humidity that drips down, especially in this climate. You do want to keep your seeds dry. Um, freezers, usually not a great option unless the seed moisture content is below 10% because ice crystals will form within the seed and ice crystals burst the cells if you get a lower germination rate. Um, airtight containers are good if you can use them. I like to use Ziploc bags and I put the packets in them, seal them, and I put them in those totes. Works pretty good. Um, you can use jars. You do want to label seeds with the date collected, um, or you know most seed packets will have that on there, the date that it's from, which year's crop. If it's seed you're saving, make sure you have the date for the year, because you want to put the older seed out there first, you know, and keep your new seed for next year. Packing. How many seeds are in this pack? <laughs> it says six grams, so if we do that math, I looked it up. 600 seeds of lettuce, five or six seeds is 3,000 seeds. Does your average community garden or home grower need 3,000 lettuce plants? No, we do not. We want to conserve this resource and be smart about getting it out there. They don't need 3,000 seeds, but hey, they might need 100, you know? Um, what I do is I repack seed into coin envelopes. Each household, um, most of our houses have very small gardens here. They might get 50 lettuce seeds. Um, if it's pumpkin seeds, they might get six, right? That's still a lot of pumpkins if you have a patio. You know, 30 bean seeds. Um, what I like about breaking them into smaller quantities too is it allows people to try different things. You know, they can a little of this, a little of that, and see what works for their garden. Um, I try to really tailor it to the clientele group. So I'll send a care package to a school garden and I might throw that whole pack in. And I know they'll use it in the semester, but the average person coming to the seed library doesn't need 3,000 seeds. <laughs> Labeling. Um, here's those coin envelopes that I use. And they're really cheap on Amazon. That's still the best price. It's about $13 for 500. That's something I get donated a lot. But when you're breaking them into smaller packs, you're not getting all of this info, right? You're just, you got a blank slate. So I do always try to include the crop name. So here's radish. The cultivar is known. People look it up on their phones when they're going through the seeds. And they'll say, ooh, that sounds cool. I want to see what that's all about. So at least from that info, they can find this info usually. How many days till harvest, seed spacing, things like that. You got to have a dollar tree. Yeah, these came from Dollar Tree. They will donate seeds to you. Most dollar, most dollar stores have seeds. Yes, yes. So what you No, I don't put the seed company. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about acknowledging donations. But I just want to keep it real basic because I'm filling 500 of these in a Tuesday night. You know? um, I do note on the packet, usually down here in this part, if it's treated seed, because a lot of people don't open up a packet of treated sweet corn and like, why is it pink? You know, and they don't want that if they're organic gardeners. I will note if it's an heirloom, especially something real cool. Um, if it's rare, we have some people who are all about the rare collard 
questions here, so I'll, I'll make a note about that. Um, if it's a native plant to Louisiana, because I have people come look for that. Um, if it's medicinal, I have some herbalists in the neighborhood. Um, if you need to soak or scarify the seed to get it to germinate, put that on the pack, or at least make a note from our little basket. If it's older seed, um, like I mentioned the Ed Hume Seed Company, they donated literal pallets of seeds in the year after Katrina. People are still giving those seeds out. And that pack of lettuce, you might get three out of that 3,000 germany. I want to know if it's old seeds, so I put it in there. Um, so people are willing to take that chance. Um, I also, this is a pretty new one. I try to note if it's good in containers or small spaces, because what I found is most of the home gardeners coming to the seed library are growing in containers. So if it's something like a compact bush bean, um, a cucumber that's been hybridized to grow on a small trellis, I make a note of that. And they're able to choose accordingly. Labor. <laughs> Who will store the collection and where? Right now it's in my laundry room. <laughs> Who's gonna fill these seed packets every week? Because you will have to do it every week. Master gardeners, interns, community members, I use all three. It's me and a bunch of people. Um, who maintains the inventory? That's something um, I do because I house the collection, the needs of the space, and the energy for a fridge. So it does show up on my power bill, but that's something I'm just donating, right? So if you're using a fridge to store the seeds, you're gonna have to account for that energy. Who will protect it from disasters? Here, last year, we didn't have power for 16 days at my house. Mm -hmm. I lost some seed, <laughs> you know? I wasn't here to deal with it. But we have a large um, seed bank project going on at the Arabic Community Center, and there's actually a protocol written in where if there's a hurricane, Blaze is gonna load it up in his truck and take it to Colorado. <laughs> so have that built in, especially in your, if you're in a natural disaster prone area. Who packages seeds and when? Um, what I found is it takes roughly three hours or one Netflix movie to fill five <laughs> And I do this one too. <laughs> so you could be sitting there doing something else. I do a lot of Zoom meetings, seed packet filling. I'm sure some of you have seen me do it. If you have for this. Um, but it does take time and you have to stay consistent. Consistency is key. The last thing you want is people to show up to the seed library and not be in the same place. You know, because sometimes they hop on a bus and across town to get there. And you don't want to have people be disappointed. Um, distribution. This is the seed library in front of my house. And I'm sure you guys have seen these for books, but you can do the same things for seeds. Um, there's actually gardening books in here. Um, this is accessible 24 7. I think that's super important. Yes. So, what do you do about pee? There's such a great turnover. Um, I'm stocking, oh, okay. usually in the morning if I see things are getting low. Those seeds, they're removing about 750 seeds a month, packs of seeds. Wow. And it's so okay. fast that the viability has not been a problem. But I keep a repository of pre-filled point on low seed packets in my house and where it's in the fridge. And I just restock them. Yeah. Okay. Right here. It's not any different from a normal library, except this is for gardeners. It's um, exactly the same. Yep. So, how many people do you think walk past this? Because like we've been going like this in our community, but our rotary was cooling. Yes. So we have 300 people. So I don't know, like maybe that would be, maybe there would be a good night turnover. That, I would say if you get 300 people, is that a week or a So that's how many members. Oh, you would definitely have enough turnover. Oh, okay. um, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of it open so you can see how many packs are in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, some of the distribution challenges I've run into, like this has been great. And I'll show you some more examples of this kind of setup. Um, I get people who are not able to get there physically, request seed, and I'll mail it to them. You know, I'll just I'll postmark it and send it to them. Um, there's costs associated with that, so if you get postage donated somewhere, that's always great. Um, Sometimes seeds are available at events and gatherings, and I've got some good pictures of that coming up. But I do have the seeds sorted by type, um, so people can choose what's best for them, what they're looking for. I don't want to make that decision for them. You know, it's their garden. <laughs> Here's some examples. These things can look a lot of different ways. Our public library system here in New Orleans, there's actually two um, open source seed libraries. They're accessible to the public. They're 
always available during open hours. You have to have a library card though, and you're allowed to check out five packs at a time. Oh, wow. Yep. So that's been really cool, and librarians are super organized. Wow. <laughs> so if you look at how nice this is. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are some cons. It's limited to the open hours of the library. They're not open after hours or in the evenings or on Sundays sometimes. And you have a limited number of packets you can check out at one time. So you check them out. Okay? You check them out so that they can have a record of what's been checked out each year for their grants. Um, so if you don't have to bring them back, but you can bring them back. If you save seed off of that, they will take and the librarians will package them into the look at how <laughs> So it does function like a library. But they're not the labels you have them. Yeah, and they just print them and, and they have volunteers also. So that's a really good thing to do. Um, the, another one, this is Sprout and All, I mentioned them. They have a library too, um, and they do tabled events and mostly the farmers markets or community wellness events, and they'll bring out their seeds and give them away to the participants. It's a really broad outreach opportunity. I think they catch a lot of people who are maybe very new at gardening or um, new to healthy eating. So that's really cool. And they partner with other attractions and organizations. So there might be a bounce house right next to them, but they're giving the seeds away, and that's really awesome. Um, they target specific audiences sometimes interested in gardening. So she'll bring them to the farmer's market. You know, you got people there that are interested in local food, gardening, stuff like that. Um, some cons, limited to open hours. May not be open to general public if it's a paid or ticketed event. Um, and then she's gonna haul and set everything up every time. So it's something to think about. But that is a model that you can incorporate. We have a network of a lot of these little free seed libraries here. Um, I think this is a really great way to do it because it's always accessible. You can um, put it in front of your house or your garden. Some of the cons, open to vandalism. I've had my seeds disappear and everything inside of it three times. Um, and somebody ripped the door off, but I put it back on. And it, the key is just put it all back. Just yeah. put more out there immediately. Don't make a big deal about it. Don't call the community meeting and make a big deal about it. Just put more stuff out. And guess what? They stop messing with it. Um, so that's what I've learned. Uh, the seeds need to be stocked regularly in high temps. So that's something I'm glad you brought up, where I'm rotating the stock. I know what I put out there at certain times, and I'm putting more out as it gets depleted. It's not getting too hot and too long. Um, there is some exposure to the elements. So you can see this one's got a plexiglass. Cover. I have plexiglass on mine too, but if it rains at a certain angle from the northeast, a little bit of rain gets in there. So just something to think about when you're designing them. Uh, you can also provide what I call add-ons with these seed libraries. So free plants. This is my friend Hex's free plant wagon. It's a bike trailer. <laughs> he moves it around. Um, plastic pot and tray recycling. People do that at my house. So if you want to start seeds, you can pick up a tray and some pots and take it home and get them going. Um, and the landscapers like that because they drop them off after a job and they don't have to throw them away. So it's a recycling street. Um, so something to include, and all I use is a metal rack and they do that. Um, compost drop off, this is a Galvez community garden. Some of you might visit them on Sunday during the tours. They do community compost bins. So you can save your compost and drop it off and pick up some seeds. Um, here's another plant distro. This is at uh, broad, the Broad uh, Street Whole Foods. They have a little community garden. Um, I provide soil test kits and handouts. People bring their old gardening supplies, like if they're moving, they don't need their hand tools, they'll drop them off, somebody will come get them. Um, and then we've even done community mulch and soil drops, where people will come and get what they need. Um, here's what it looks like inside my library. So I've got them sorted, cottage flowers, cool season veggies, herbs, um, these are soil test boxes, so they can pick those up and send them to our LSU lab. I go through about 500 of those a month. So what I found is people do not want to come to my office, Joe's office, City Hall, to get a soil test box, but they will take the bus to my house and pick one up. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome, right? Removing barriers. Yeah. Can anyone like, get a bulk amount of these soil test kits and be lucky? Yes, uh, and I've had community groups who they might table and they need the test kits for a school. They want to do like a, a lab project. That's something that they do. 
Um, I also have handouts in here, and I have a, a picture coming up. These are planting guides. Um, for fruit plants, mm -hmm. do you go out there and water them every day? Yes. Okay. If you have fruit plants, then I actually have, um, you can't see it, but this door is open. It has a QR code for our newsletter, and it says, hey, if you grew more plants than you need, share them with your neighbors, your family, your friends, or drop them off here. Yeah. So I water usually when I get home. So do you have any thoughts that would like to I would love that for my entire house. But <laughs> <laughs> I have a hose. But yes, that would be great someday. <laughs> trying to think about how to do it in a mm -hmm. way where some of them have to be off the hook. Yeah. You know, where you can just set a timer. And you could with a, a battery yeah. timer. Yeah. Easily. But I just do it when I, I park my car right And it's just at your house. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I'm very yeah. Um, before you move on, uh, I want the city say this. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you had to build into the system for your CP ships to Colorado. So no, that's uh, one of the seed bank projects that I worked at. Yeah. Okay, so this has to be which? Oh, no. Uh, he's just taken up to a friend's house in Colorado. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. That's that's a, oh, yeah. Okay. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you can see this is a seed library, and then there's this metal baking rack next to it. That's where people leave um, supplies. You see the, the pot, plastic pots and trays. People are always coming to get those. They just loaded someone's car last night for those ones. And then this is a mulch pile that an arborist friend dropped off. And that's the sewer and water board moving the mulch pile for me for free because they got some seeds. <laughs> what's, the, what's the funding source for the soil test kit? Um, so it's a free kit, but there is a lab fee of $10 when they send it in. So LSU covers it essentially? They don't cover it. We have a lead test through the Department of Health that's free, that's covered through a grant, but the actual NPK, PH, there is a lab fee. Okay. But when people call our prescription offices and say, hey, I need a soil test kit, They'd rather come get it here is what I'm finding. So, yeah. so those are some patterns. They pay for it. Oh, okay. yeah, that is a barrier. I'd love to get a grant to provide that, but with the lead, they actually got it done. So that's something I'm working with with the nutritional side. Really like to be able to offer that. Sorting and organizing. Um, I tend to sort them by crop type, by season. Here we have really three growing seasons, fall, cool season, spring. And then summer, it's just so hot, we don't do much. Um, I do, when school is about to start or the semester changes, I'll pre bundle care kits for schools so it's easy to pop it in the mail. So it's a little bit of everything for the raised beds. Um, clearly labeled, it really helps. And then I talked about waterproof being huge. Because um, we do get power outages, it's an unreliable grid, and sometimes accidents happen. Um, curating the seeds, like I said, when they're donating, they're not always sending stuff that's appropriate for your area. So know your growing zone, know your recommended varieties. Um, if you get stuff you can't use, I'll send it to friends up in Michigan. And visit <laughs> you know, so you can redonate. There's no rule against redonating. Um, give out the old seed first, save your new seed for last. Make sure you know things on the label of interest. Um, and then release the seeds in season. This is really important. Here's our growing zones. Um, you're in New Orleans, so you're right here. You see how that's a much higher growing zone? Mm -hmm. That's the urban heat island effect, and then we're also surrounded by water, mm -hmm. the river and the lake, so we're a microclimate here. That's a lot different than our even our LSU planting guides can account for. It's, it's a very specialized growing zone. Um, so I created a hyper-local seeding guide, and it's an open source document, and other um, flower growers, farmers are contributing to that. They're three owners. And this is what it used to look like after Katrina. You see real basic, it's just the basic vegetables, but it's since evolved, um, this is our LSU one, it's evolved into this. So it's named like very specific to zone 9B, New Orleans. And it's got a lot more info. It's not just the vegetables, but it's got the herbs, the flowers, because people really want to put flowers in their gardens, the fruit, and even the natives, what you need to be doing with the native plants. And it's got our first frost date, last frost date, and how you should start or plant the stuff. And it's all uh, coded. So DS means direct sow. T means transplant. And they can come pick this up out of the seed library, and all the other seed libraries are now carrying this too. And it's a living document that gets edited each month, printed in, um, I think I print 200 a month for people to pick up, and then it gets shared on social media. Um, Let's skip over that. So acquiring new seeds, I made a spreadsheet in Excel. 
to reach out to the seed um, companies. And I've got their name, do they need my tax exemption, who do I contact, and notes. Like Baker Creek, they'll give you a $100 gift card on the website and you can spend it on whatever you want. Wow. Which is awesome. Does everyone do that? <laughs> <laughs> benchmarks to meet for certain ones. Again, some of them, they ask you cover shipping. <laughs> some of them have, uh, you know, requests due by February 1st. So I try to make a note of that. And then I send out letters to everyone and I keep track of who I contacted and if they sent something. So I don't waste my time the next year. <laughs> yes, trying to save time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's, uh, seed saving is a great thing to do, but this is really more about curating a collection, getting it out there. If you're interested in saving seed, to give out Seed to Seed is a really great book um, you can get online. Um, seed keeping classes, I think, is a really great thing you can add to your community garden offerings if you're doing any kind of educational programming. Um, but you can really create networks of seed savers. Um, there are about 16 little free seed libraries in New Orleans. I have them all mapped, um, and they're open to the public, which is awesome. So it's something you can definitely do just about anywhere. Um, some of them will require um, you put in a promo material out. It's usually a little postcard. I know Botanical Interest Seed Company sends one. Um, seed Savers Exchange has something they ask that you post in your seed library. Make sure you display them. Make sure you send a thank you note. And if you do the social media thing, a thank you post. So usually if I'm unboxing, <laughs> right, um, I'll say, oh, thank you Baker Creek for the donation and tag them. And it goes a long way. Um, I keep track of the number of packets I distribute each year too, because that's important data when I'm seeking funding. There's 500 a box, so I keep a simple tally on a sheet of paper on the wall. I also keep a running list of organizations, schools, and community gardens who receive seeds from the seed library. It's important to show impact, so photos are good. If those spaces are getting seed, ask them to shoot you a quick photo when they're out there planting. That's always great. And that is awesome when you're applying for grants. So it's something to keep in mind at all times. And building the network. So this is the map of all the little seed libraries in New Orleans. There's quite a few of them. Um, and there's new ones all the time. And that's me with the mayor. <laughs> Maybe the mayor some seeds. Um, but it's all about building that network. No one person can do it. But some of these are community gardens. Some of them are in front of schools. One's in front of Whole Foods. But most of them are in front of people's houses. So it's really cool. Uh, this is my contact info. And that seed library is at 1811 Louisa Street. <laughs> if you want to stop by while you're in town. Um, but I'm easy to get a hold of. If you're trying to set something up like this, let me know. I'm happy to tell you whatever I've learned. Yeah. I'm just curious if anybody in here who has a seed library. Is, there, is anybody? Yeah, I'm There's a whole network of them in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's about 15 or 18. Or is there anybody in Atlanta Metro that has one? Um, I want a public library in Clay County has one. It's a big um, battle tree okay. um, location in Jonesboro. <laughs> So that's something, you know, in Atlanta folks, maybe it might be a good thing to start a network. So if I reach out to them, will you share the slideshow with me so that I can... Yes, yep, absolutely. And I can send you the spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any kind of national effort to get Master Gardeners to be more supportive to see Saving Library? Not on the national level, but I know locally, I, I'm a Master Gardener coordinator and I have a group of volunteers that love to fill seed packets because it's easy, you know. Um, I have not heard of a national concerted effort, but I know locally we have a team that really likes to work with the seeds and save seeds. Um, some of the heirloom varieties we're about to start growing out to save seeds from. So it's something that could be improved on. What was the question? Oh, if there was a master gardener effort nationwide uh, to build this kind of thing, I, I don't know. I know in Louisiana, I've helped a few other agents set it up with their master gardeners. I know um, Hill Acton and St. Tammany have set it up. So, yeah, it's something you could do. You mentioned um, microclimate. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand what it is exactly. So, you've also seen the USDA hardiness zone on the back of the seed packet, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, if you look at Louisiana, it's not right for our area because we're hotter here. We're hotter and wetter and we stay hotter longer. So it's actually, um, we're actually, if you look at the data, we're 10B and not 9A and if you look at the seed packet. So that, that pushes up our planting dates and it pushes back our fall planting dates by sometimes three or four weeks, depending on how hot it is. So you see the USDA map, but that might not always correspond. If you're in an urban area, all the concrete, the yeah. buildings, the structures, they hold and retain heat. And then here we're surrounded by water, which also bothers the climate. Yeah. So it's a microclimate. Other questions? Okay, thank you all.